Hello, hello. Welcome to Saturday night's Hidden Hour. I'm going to pull my microphone out because then I don't have to lean over here. My back pa- my background looks a little different for those that watch our YouTube uh, because I'm still setting up my desk in the office. Um, Ikea, never underestimate the, the physics that is Ikea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, how about the complexity? Yeah, the complexity. But we are on our way. We are on our way. And we have a very special show for you tonight. And the reason I can say that with um, sincerity and uh, confidence is because this show and and this case that we are going to cover, uh, it was chosen specifically by Dr. John. And the reason that he wanted to cover this case with our gems tonight, our hidden gems, is because Uh, He's had his eye on this case for a long time, and he feels that the conversation that comes from this case is uh, worthwhile, important, and uh, will, will, you know, make us think. So I tonight am actually, like many of you, I am an audience member uh, along with you listening to Dr. John. Of course, he's my husband, Uh, but... Uh, so I will be I will be looking at a lot of your questions as well, and hopefully asking some of the questions that you have. And uh, if I could just remind everyone, because this is genuinely so helpful for us, if you do want to support us, but please like um, this video, but also subscribe to our channel. Subscribing does so much. It's it's not just um, oh look, it, you know they have uh, a higher you know they have a a higher a su- subscription or subscriber number. It actually helps us in investigating cases. We we can get more interviews. We can have a, a larger reach. So if you like what we are doing um, and you appreciate uh, our channel and what we bring to the true crime community, uh, su- uh, subscribing to our channel, liking our video, it really helps. And then for those of you that are On Patreon, thank you so much. We had a couple new episodes come down today. We also have an array of documents, and I'll be talking um, about those later this week on YouTube, but we have all of the Springville, Utah documents on our Patreon account right now for the Ruby Frankie, Jody Hildebrandt case. We have um, hundreds of pages of um, what the defense filed when it comes to Abby and Libby um, in Indiana, and an array and and then a couple of uh good morning conversations that you and I had so <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah behind the scenes behind the scenes conversations and so a patreon is a place where you can support us and uh, we give back so with that out of the way i'm going to hand over the show to my husband dr john dr babe and uh, I'm I'm looking forward to hearing about this case that you have been following and, and care a lot about and ask the questions we all have. Yeah, so let, let's, well, first of all, I, I feel like, so this has been a case that's been on my mind for a few months. The origins of my knowledge of this case actually go t- to Nancy Grace and Nancy Grace and her, her producer reached out to me and asked me if I would be on a podcast where they were going to talk about Rand Hooper. And I didn't know who Rand Hooper was. I noticed in one of our comments earlier that somebody was from Richmond, Virginia, and she too didn't know who Rand Hooper was. And the Rand Hooper case is occurring in in Virginia. So apparently I'm not the only one. This is not, it has not been a well-publicized case, but since I looked into it after the Nancy Grace podcast contacted me, I've just been completely fascinated by it. it. It's it's not a particularly difficult case in terms of the details, but I think the philosophical implications are 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 strong. I think there's there's a lot of really interesting questions here about friendship and morality, and so sometimes with cases we get a unique opportunity to really step back and think about the larger ramifications of a crime. And I think this is definitely one of those instances. So I will start by, oh, and let me mention too that, so in that, in that vein, I received an email from someone this week and she said, 
you know, your, your, your YouTube channel and your podcasts are super nerdy. Uh, and but then she said, but I'm a nerd and I love it. So, so, um, so th- I think the show tonight is going to be a little bit more on the nerdy side. So f- for those who are a little nerdy, including myself, uh, this show will give us a little break from Idaho and Utah, which, you know, which has just been on fire with crazy cases for those of you who follow us. So we're going to, we're going to actually travel to the East coast a little bit tonight and talk about a case that is not, has not been widely publicized but I think it's it's a really fascinating case. So, thank you. Well, let's hear those details. We yeah. want to know. We're all we're all dying to know what this case is about. Who is Rand Hooper? So Rand Hooper, his 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 real name, his full name is John Randolph Hooper. He goes by the nickname of Rand. Rand Hooper is presently thirty six years old. This crime that we're going to be talking about occurred in twenty seventeen August. 10th or 11th of 2013 of 2017. And so it's been a while. This, this, there's been a lot of twists and turns in this case. And that's actually, what's that? Six years. It's been six years. Yeah. Six years. Right. Six years. And, and that has been a real, that has created a lot of turmoil for, from some of the victims as well, I should say. So Gordon McCormick, who's the brother of Graham McCormick, who's the deceased in this case, has has really had a hard time with it. And the sister, Catherine, I, I'm sure she has too. She hasn't been as vocal about it, but Gordon has talked about the toll it's taken and the fact that it's taken so long has really affected his mental health. So um, so I want to say up front that that's a big part of this case is that the family of the victim who's Graham McCormick has really been affected by this and it's it's really taken a toll on them and, and we don't want to overlook that. So but the 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 so just to get into the there's sort of a long version and a short version. Let me start with the the short version, and then you can ask questions, Lauren, because you don't know this case very well. So I will be happy to fill in some of the details. The short version is that Rand Hooper in 2017, August 10th of 2017, invited four other people to his house, or I should say his boat house, actually his father, his parents' boat house, where they owned a couple of boats in Virginia. I think it was the, I don't know exactly the location of that, but they, these friends essentially came over to engage in a weekend of partying and boating and whatever else they were going to do. The four friends included Willis Blair, who is Rand Hooper's girlfriend. I believe that's his wife now, although I can't confirm that. Willis Blair has a sister, Winston Blair, and her boyfriend, Ralph Daniel, was also present in addition to, and all of them lived in the area. And then Rand Hooper specifically reached out to the victim here, Graham McCormick, who lived in Atlanta, and he invited him up for the weekend. And Graham came up because apparently they're very close. They had a very close relationship and so Graham flew up and was quite happy to be there, apparently. So the evening starts with a lot of drinking. This, Chelsea's you know, the, asking, Chelsea's yeah. asking how old all, all of these people were. How old was Graham? How old was Yeah, uh, so they're all Graham. roughly I don't have the ages on all of them, but at the time of the crime, Rand Hooper would have been 30 years old. And I believe Graham was roughly the same age. So they're all roughly going to be in that age range, 30-ish, give or take. Although it's not it's not listed. Their ages are not listed in the court documents. So I only know Rand's age specifically here. But I, I presume that they're all more or less in that same age range. So this is a group of, you know, post-college students that are still in the part. They're still they're young adults or, you know, I guess – you know, sort of getting on the verge of getting out of young adulthood, but uh, but very much interested in partying, and and that was the intent for the weekend. So, thirty one years old was Graham McCormick. Just looked it up. Okay, at the time of the okay, at the time at the time of the crash, this has a this has a uh, I'll be honest, a Murdoch beginning feel. Yeah, 
go on. Right. Yeah, we're right. I was going to mention that that there there are there are, you know, shades of Paul Murdoch going on here for sure. The, the difference is that Paul Murdoch was in a boat with several other people and when this particular crime occurred, Graham McCormick was the only one in the boat at the time. So this group starts drinking and I, you know, they go to dinner, they go to some bars. They're, they're, I'm sure they're pretty inebriated. Um, they decide to go out on the, on the, it's the, let me get this right here. It's the Rappahannock river in Virginia. And that, wow. that presumably is where the boathouse is located somewhere on the Rappahannock river. And so they go out boating as a group, they're drinking, they're having fun. They come back. Um, they continue apparently on the the wharf by the boat, continue to party and talk and drink and listen to music. And at some point, a couple of the, the people present, uh, specifically Willis, I believe, and her sister Winston, they all go to bed. And then Ralph Daniel falls shortly after, which – which leaves of uh, Graham McCormick and Rand Hooper still awake, roughly around 11.30 p.m. that evening. And we don't know why, but for whatever reasons, Rand, I think, convinces Graham McCormick to continue their party on the boat. The boat is a 21-foot... I don't know anything about boats, by the way, but um, the boat is a 21-foot Boston whaler, um, I just I, I googled it quickly, and it this appears to be a really a fairly expensive high end brand of boat. But I, again, I don't know anything about boats. But these these boats new run anywhere from from what I can tell twenty five thousand to two hundred thousand dollars, depending on the make and model. So not a cheap boat necessarily. Uh, and as a, as an aside, the family owns multiple boats apparently. So. This might be part of the story at some point. Okay, but, I'm like, okay. But, yeah, we'll, we'll get more into that when, when we talk about uh, this potential sense of entitlement with with Rand Hooper. I think that will become a part of this story. But gotcha. So they go out on the boat, and I don't I don't know if Graham was intoxicated, but clearly Rand was was very intoxicated, and. It seems like they were heading back to the boathouse on a certain part of the river when the boat collides with a bulkhead. And for the, those of you who don't know what a bulkhead is, and I didn't know until this case, but I'm just going to read from the court documents. This is the uh, Court of Appeals decision. Um, they define a bulkhead as, quote, a retaining wall along a waterfront. So it's a retaining wall. Often they're made of, of wood or metal and the boat crashes into this retaining wall. It damages the retaining wall. It damages the bulkhead and it damages the side of the boat and the under part of the boat. When the boat crashes into the bulkhead, Rand Hooper is thrown to the right of the boat and Graham McCormick is thrown off the boat into the river. Mm -hmm. Graham, you know, this is, so this is where it gets complicated. So according to a later story that Rand Hooper tells, he crashes in. Well, first of all, he denies that there's any crash. He denies that they even went out on the river. There's, there's all kinds of changes in story here, but, but essentially he makes a statement later and he says that I'll, I'll read it. So okay. this is from the court of appeals document. This is page three. When he does make a statement, uh, he says, so while the two men, which is Rand and Graham, while the two men were riding in the Boston whaler that night, Hooper remembered quote, that the boats hit something hard. Hooper then stated I recall immediately turning the boat's engine off, turning its deck light on, and calling out for Graham's name. 
unquote. Hooper said that, quote, he did not see nor hear Graham, unquote. Hooper then, quote, restarted the boat's engine and headed to the boat dock up Carter's Creek towards my parents' home there without McCormick. So by Rand Hooper's own admission, he's driving the boat. He hits this bulkhead. Graham is thrown out of the boat. He, he does the most cursory check to see if Graham's okay. He doesn't hear anything. He doesn't see anything. And it appears like within minutes, he turns the boat around or he, he, he takes the boat and heads home to his parents' house. So he left him. He left him. Right. He left him. He essentially left him for dead. I mean, he didn't know, you know, he, he later changed his story a number of times. And actually, so, <laughs> so it, you know, there's, there's different versions. He first denies it. The, so the next morning, the, the, the group notices that Graham is not there and they're worried. And Rand Hooper says, well, maybe he had a panic attack and he went to the hospital. Rand goes up to his bedroom. He notices the, the bed hasn't been slept in. He acts like he doesn't know where Graham is. He acts like nothing happened or he's not aware of what happened. He essentially plays dumb with the other group. So at some point around 10, 30, 11 ish that morning, one of the, the members of the party, which is Winston, Winston Blair, who's, who's Rand's wife's sister. Okay. Winston calls the police and reports a missing person. So Rand Hooper is not the one who reports this crime, by the way. So Rand Hooper knows that Graham's in the boat and he fell off the boat and he hasn't seen or heard from him for hours. In fact, let me, <laughs> this is, this is one of the most interesting parts of the, I'm going to read a, I'm going to continue to read the court doc here. Um, this, this tells me a little bit about Rand Hooper, by the way, which we'll get into more, but, um, so page three again, uh, Winston, who's Winston Blair, Winston testified that she and Daniel woke up together the following morning and they met Hooper and Willis in the main area of the house. Willis, Winston, Daniel, and Hooper then walked the dogs together. When they returned, Hooper scheduled tea times at a nearby golf course for the group. Yeah, you know, as Stephanie May just mentioned, it's so sad. This sounds like the Paul incident with Mallory Beach. They at least looked for Mallory Beach. Right. They looked for Mallory Beach. But so this, 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 this scheduling tea times thing is just unfathomable to me in the sense yeah. that this guy's pretending like nothing happened. He knows his friend is out in the river, right? Probably dead. And yet he's acting like nothing happened. In fact, not only that, he's, he's, he wants to go play golf with his buddies. He walks the dogs. Right. He pretends like. It's not too bad of a hangover. He's walking the dogs. He's, he's walking the, the dog. Right. He's right. He's doing okay. He's not like laying in bed with a massive migraine either. He's right. This, this is somebody I think that can probably handle a lot of alcohol fairly well, by the way. So he has, he has a history of DUIs, at least multiple DUIs. Uh, during one of his DUIs, apparently he shot someone by accident. So that's, that's an interesting part of the story too. But, but just this, this, this picture of him waking up, pretending like he doesn't know where Graham is making a tea time for golf. Right. Like really? Right. And so in the right. meantime, so I, I mean, part of the picture here is you have a guy who, so his parents apparently are in Africa I don't know why they're in Africa. I, I imagine they're like on safari or something. And, you know, so he's, his parents are in Africa. He's at their boathouse. He's running around in his parents' Boston whaler, partying with his buddies, making tea times for golf, right? I mean, none of that ne necessarily might be relevant except for the fact that I, I think clearly there is some sense of entitlement here. And, you know, part of the story here is that wealth and privilege probably play a role as well. So um, one piece of the story is that the judge 
So <laughs> Rand was supposed to go before the judge in 2019. It took two years to get to that point. So again, like Paul Murdoch, there's the, all these delays. The judge recuses himself <clears throat> because he acknowledges that he told the prosecution that there probably wasn't sufficient evidence to convict someone of a crime. So in other words, the judge is essentially saying that he's biased. Wow. And that he doesn't he doesn't feel like he can conduct a fair trial because he thinks the evidence is flimsy. Anybody who reads the, by the way, anybody who reads the Court of Appeals of Virginia um, document will see that the evidence is not flimsy at all. I mean, it's not, a lot of it's circumstantial in the sense that they're getting statements from witnesses and they're getting statements from Rand, but there's still quite a bit of evidence here. So so Winston Blair contacts the police. They show up and Rand says he doesn't remember what happened. Again, he's, there's a sort of amnesia going on. He's in denial. He's not acknowledging that that he was in the boat. And then about 30 minutes later, a neighbor by the bulkhead where the boat crashed notices two things. He notices one, that there's a body in the water face up. And he notices that the bulkhead has been damaged. Mm. So he calls the police. They come and discover, they find the body they contact the police that are over at Rand Hooper's house and Winston Blair, who reported this particular, you know, who reported the missing person. She's actually the one who goes and identifies the body, not Rand Hooper. He's nowhere to be found. He doesn't, he just, he wants to keep his distance. He doesn't want anything to do with this. As you know, someone pointed out, Stephanie pointed out, this is like a hit and run. It's pretty much a, except that he was in the boat with him, but it's the same thing as a hit and run. Just nobody saw it. I'm just going to go to bed and everyone else is going to clean up after me. Right. That's, that's a great observation. Um, in, in fact, so the, the, the case, the charges change frequently in this case. So it starts off as second degree murder and then it becomes involuntary manslaughter and they added uh, hit and run, felony hit and run. So in fact, it, it does become a hit and run case, actually. The difference, however, between, and this is a really critical difference, the difference between a typical hit and run and this particular case is that Graham McCormick is his best friend. So I guess it would, you know, typically in a hit and run, you might, hit a, you might hit a pedestrian that you don't know or a stranger, or right? But Yeah, like in that, you know, that hit and run last year that I did. No, just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, no, I know when you hear right. about hit and runs, it's usually a stranger hitting, right? And stranger. so, but not, and, and I think that's that's what makes this case so interesting. Is is I mean, tragic. Let me, you know, let me just say that tragic, really tragic, because that's another piece of information that's really critical in this case, which is when Graham McCormick goes into the water, he's alive. He doesn't die from injury sustained after the the accident, after the yeah. the the bulkhead is hit. He dies from drowning. So the coroner rules. There's no that, head trauma or there's anything. no. Well, I don't. I you know I didn't. I just know that the cause of death was drowning. There might have been some trauma, but it's not what it's not what Killed leads up. to his right. Right. His so so that's part of the tragedy too. Here is that. If Graham McCormick, I mean, I'm sorry, if Rand Hooper had done the minimal amount to try to find his friend and or, and or called the police instantly or the Coast Guard or whoever needs to get involved, Graham McCormick might still be alive. And Brutally, brutally Honest just mentioned his body was found right where the, the crash occurred. That's unlike right, Mallory exactly. Beach. Mallory, Mallory Beach was swept away. She was found in a different location in the end, but he, he, he was found right there. He could have found him. He absolutely could have found him, right. And, and the, the cause of death being drowning, essentially, is, it makes it even more tragic in the sense that he goes into the water alive. 
he probably could have been found. If if Rand Hooper can't find him because he's too intoxicated, then he needs to get other people. He could have gotten other people over there who could have found him. But he claims that he calls out his name, he doesn't hear anything, and at some point he just decides that he's going to leave the scene and leave his friend for dead. So that's what happens. So I, I think the part of this crime that that I just can't get past is the fact that Graham McCormick is supposedly his best friend. And he's right, his best friend. I'm trying to think of my best friend, and I I, I hope that I have no friend. Somebody right, somebody says with friend. with friends like him who who needs enemies, right? Exactly. So um and a best friend, let alone a best friend. So there are different so this case evolves over time. Um, you know, COVID comes into play, things get delayed a lot. The defense attorneys are trying to get the case dismissed, saying there's insufficient evidence, all this kind of stuff that typically goes on. Finally, it goes to trial. A jury convicts him. He's sentenced to 15 years. Nine of those years are suspended. So he gets six years, essentially six years, which given the laws in Virginia, if he's a reasonably good inmate, he'll probably do 60% of that. So, but in spite of that, th this is another part of the case that's kind of head scratching. In spite of that, Rand Hooper wants to continue to deny his involvement in the crime in the sense that in the appeal, he argues that there's insufficient evidence, number one, and number two. So this is after sentencing. He argues not only is there insufficient evidence, but he wasn't driving the boat. Again, right? Shades of Paul Murdoch. Yes. Many shades. And shades. Right. And so, so that was, that became one of his later, he changed the story a lot, but the, this, he wasn't driving the boat became a big part of his argument because presumably nobody could prove it. So um, initially he didn't say that, but he did. Well, initially he said that not, he wasn't on the water at all, but they were able to show that the boat had damage that was consistent with the paint on the bulkhead, right? They were able to tie the, the boat to the bulkhead and show that there was an accident and they were able to show obviously that Graham McCormick's body was right by the bulkhead. So, <laughs> so that's, that, that was part of the evidence, but at sentencing, this is what Rand Hooper said. To the and, and when was sentencing? When was sentencing? Was this last year? Since no sentencing was fairly recently. So this is the reason this case is relevant is because uh, a judge ruled on the appeal roughly two weeks ago and sentencing was wow. maybe about two or three months ago. I think sentencing occurred this summer. So I, I want to say July. So years, okay. So six years after the crash, we have a sentencing. You Rand, have right. Rand you have a, you have a jury trial. You have a jury trial. He's convicted. He goes to sentencing. This is what Rand Hooper says at sentencing. He doesn't say a lot, but this is what he says. He says, quote, Graham McCormick is one of the greatest people I've ever met, unquote. And then he said, which and here's a moment of, I don't know what, vulnerability or admission or disclosure. He also says, quote, the safety of everyone at that house was my responsibility. And for that, I am sorry. Now notice that, and this is before the appeal. This is before he, he, he comes back and says, I wasn't driving the boat. So essentially he, he basically recants his, his very weak apology at sentencing. But notice that the this, this statement, the, this apology uh, at sentencing, he says the safety of everyone at that house was my response. Yeah. You know, I noticed there's, that. What, yeah, what's that about? There's no apology for Graham, right? The, the interesting part about that is he's still not taking responsibility. He's just saying everyone at the house, even though he was on a boat with Graham. Well, he's not. He's, he's indirectly, I guess, acknowledging his involvement in this crime. But he's not, you know, that <laughs> And Gordon uh, McCormick says later that he felt a certain amount of closure over that statement, like 
Rand Hooper was actually showing a bit of remorse. Um, and this was kind of an without admission. Mentioning, of without mentioning his name? Without, without even Right, without his mentioning name. his name. Yeah, it, right, exactly. Sort of how I always feel. Just say, say, you know, yeah, wow. So there's say never it. there's never a moment here where Rand Hooper says, I'm so sorry that I caused my best friend's death in this accident. I didn't intend this. It was a mistake. It was an accident, right? But I, I, every day I miss my friend, right? There's none of that. There's simply, there's simply this, this really weak apology without mentioning Graham. And then you go to the appeals where he says, guess what? You know, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't really mean that. Uh, Graham was driving the boat. I wasn't. So let's just get rid of this whole thing. Gotcha. So I think, you know, the, the, the part about this case that I just can't get over is the friendship piece. Right. And, we, we you know, hear about hit and runs. We hear about hit and runs, sadly. it's They're heartbreaking and they're awful. May justice be served. But we hear about them. We never really hear about this when it's a friend, let alone a best friend. And you could save their life. Right, exactly. And, and so one of the thoughts I had when I was thinking about this particular crime was there's something in psychology called the bystander effect. And the bystander effect is it, it refers to the fact that the basic idea behind the bystander effect is that when a crime is committed, that if people are observing that crime, neutral parties, bystanders are, are witnessing that crime, oftentimes people are going to be less inclined to act to help a victim the more people that are present. So... Uh, the bystander effect is it comes into play because in 1964 in New York city, there's a woman named Kitty Genovese who was attacked by an assailant. It was, it, it started as a robbery and this happened near a bunch of apartments and homes. There were a lot of people that witnessed this event. And during the attack, the assailant, noticed that nobody was intervening and nobody called that the, the police weren't coming. And so he, he actually was leaving and then he returned and he assaulted the victim and he, he, he committed a homicide. So the bystander effect gets its name from, so after that, the social psychologists were particularly interested in why aren't people helping yeah. and why, what you know? What's going on with the bystander effect? I know people are asking that right now in chat too. Like, do you think he possibly wanted him dead? You know, <laughs> right? Like, well, you know what I mean? But, but I'm just saying, I, I I can't wait for you to tell us. But right, I mean, that's the speculation going on in chat right now too. Like, why would a bystander, let alone a best friend, not help? Yeah. So, so let's. Let me make some distinctions between the bystander effect and this particular situation, however. So, so the bystander effect usually involves multiple parties observing a crime. Here, you have one person, Rand Hooper. There's no bystanders. However, I think because the accident was so unexpected that in some ways I, I, I feel like Graham – I mean, I'm sorry, that Rand Hooper is in many ways – I think he, he perceives himself to be a bystander. Because he doesn't believe he's, he, I'm sure there's a certain amount of shock. He can't believe he's in this situation, and but here he is. His friend is overboard. He's potentially somewhat traumatized, and the question is at that moment, what is he going to do? Right, that's the question of bystand. When bystanders, especially multiple bystanders, are witnessing a crime, the question is, are they going to intervene? And the research on the bystander effect shows that there's a couple of elements that predict whether someone will take responsibility for helping a victim. Probably the most important one of those is the person typically asks, is the person deserving of help? 
Another one is that people are looking at the competence of the bystander. So in other words, does the bystander have the means and the skill to intervene in an effective manner? Okay. Like if, if, if a child is drowning, does, can the bystander swim? Right. Exactly. So, the, the, so that would be another element that would predict whether the bystander becomes involved. And, and again, like that, the, the thing you just mentioned about swimming, you know, presumably Rand Hooper knew how to swim, but maybe he didn't. Right. So I don't know. But so you have, you have the first one is the person deserving of help. What's the competence of the bystander? Can, if, if it's drowning, can they jump in and swim? And the third element is the relationship between the bystander and the victim. So typically, if the bystander knows the victim, there's more likelihood of intervening. So and when you and when you say does the vice does the the victim deserve to be helped? Is it because is that the whole they got themselves in this situation, or is that a dehumanizing thing too? Like oh, uh, you know, a sex worker might not be helped as much as say. Uh, a child or, or what do you mean by deserving? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It, it's, it's all of the above that, that the, the bystanders, especially if they don't know the victim, they're making some assessment of whether the person deserves help, whether they can help themselves, the nature of the crime. If somebody, like you said, if somebody falls, if a, if a child falls into the water and can't swim, is, is that person deserving of it versus maybe, the victim is in a fight with a boyfriend. There's some domestic dispute and right. Like the, maybe the bystander in that case feels like, well, if I intervene, I might get harmed. Okay. Yeah. But in this particular case, again, going back to this idea of friendship, I think you'd have to answer affirmatively for all. So the first question is the person deserving. This is his best friend. Obviously he's deserving. Is 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 Rand Hooper competent to to intervene? I, I, we don't know. I mean, but at the very least, he can call the Coast Guard or whoever needs to show up to help find somebody in the water, right? And the third element, right. the relationship between the bystander and their victim. Clearly, there's a there's a close relationship. They're best friends. So just based upon those elements, it you would like predict. He should be helping. Then any, he would help. social, any social psychologist would predict that this person should intervene. And it, it it gets worse, by the way. So they've done more research, obviously, since nineteen since the nineteen sixties and seventies on the bystander effect. And one of the things that they found is that the more dangerous the situation, and the more potentially lethal, and the more of a crisis it, it crisis the situation is, the greater the likelihood of the bystander intervening. So, in other words. If if a bystander is witnessing a crime that they appear that they believe is fairly mild and there's little risk of harm, they may or may not intervene. But if the bystander perceives that there's a serious crisis that could have life and death implications, they're much more likely to intervene. Okay. Again, this is a I, life and death thing. <laughs> right, exactly. And again, again, this is just it's head scratching in the sense that all of the research on this bystander effect would predict that Rand Hooper should be intervening at least in the most minimal way, you know, keeping the boat there, calling people for help. He's not doing any of that. He's just deciding to, to leave the, you know, to basically leave the scene. His friend is presumably still alive at that point. So he, he essentially leaves his best friend for dead in the middle, in the river. And I, it's so, just so, right. nothing's making sense. Nothing's making sense with all these studies, all these, it would be, you would help him. Every, right. The, the research here, if, if you consider Rand Hooper to be like a bystander, and I, I think the analogy for me, the analogy works because he doesn't anticipate being in this situation right? It's completely unexpected. He's sort of thrown into this. He's probably a little shocked. He doesn't know what to do, but still you would, you would predict that he would intervene at some level, but he doesn't. Correct. So, so, so again, someone, like this, someone just, 
sorry. And someone just mentioned, what about shock value, Dr. John? But I, you know, I've, I've been in shock and helping someone before. I feel like in shock, you kind of just take risks. I, I don't know, but I get that's, that's a, different for everyone. So, right. So yeah, we're, I'll talk about that in a minute. So okay, thanks. Sorry. Um, we'll stay on track. No, <laughs> so no, many it's good fine. No. So many good questions coming down chat, but I am seeing them everyone and I'll remember them. So one of the, uh, just as an aside, one of the interesting consequences of the the Kitty Genovese case and the bystander research, in effect, is that, that that's what led to what we now refer to as Good Samaritan laws, which Good Samaritan laws are essentially that if you're a bystander in, in a crime and somebody needs help, and it, especially if it's it appears to be a potentially lethal situation, then you're protected legally from if you do create some harm you're protected if you're trying to assist a victim in a way that would potentially save their life or or relieve them of some type of significant harm so that's one thing that came that's a positive thing good samaritan laws are related to the bystander effect and the kitty genovese case um as are by the way many states have what are called duty to rescue laws so in the case of Rand Hooper, it actually, that's why they were able to charge him. Because a duty to rescue law s- essentially states that if, if you're in a situation like Rand Hooper is, you have a legal obligation to try to assist that victim. Wow. And if you don't, there are going, there, there could be legal consequences. Again, like the hit and run you, we talked about earlier. So, wow. But to to really to get into the heart of this case, I think you know you you. So the question is, why doesn't he act? Right. That's the question. The big question here is, right. this is his best friend. Why doesn't he act to help him? Right. And and so that's that's really you know that's really the question we want to kind of chase down tonight. Um, And it, you know, it's, it's a big question. It's going to lead us into some, <laughs> it's going to, it's going to lead us into some philosophical stuff and psychological stuff, both, but, um, we're here for it. Okay. Well, so w- when I was thinking about the answer, well, let me, let me back up just quickly. And so part of the answer to that question has to do with what psychologists call the fundamental attribution error. And the fundamental attribution error states, this is a, a, a principle that's discussed often by social psychologists, people like Philip Zimbardo of the Stanford Prison Experiments, Stanley Milgram of the experiments where people were shocked. Some of the most famous experiments in the history of psychology have to do with the fundamental attribution error. And the fundamental attribution error states that people often overstate the importance of personality and the influence of personality in shaping one's behavior when, when the situation has more influence than they recognize. So in other words, if you think about like the Milgram experiments, which I think most people know, you know, you have somebody in a white coat telling a, 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 a subject um, to shock someone and to harm them. And the idea is that the situation involves an authority figure and a subject who feels like they have to comply with the authority figure. And so they're, they're much more likely to shock someone who, by the way, is screaming out in pain. But they're much more willing to shock the person because of the situation. So in other words, the situation is what typically might lead to that outcome and not the person's personality. So the fundamental attribution error states that we often point the finger at someone in their personality variables rather than assessing the situation. And as a forensic psychologist, by the way, this when I'm assessing risk, so if I'm assessing risk of whether someone should get on probation, for example, this is the first thing I want to look at. So I'll do a lot of personality tests and I'll look closely at the situation to look at what was the impact of that particular situation. 
And is, is it a one-off situation? Is it a situation that's very unlikely to occur again? And so my job, and if that's true, if it is an unusual situation and there's nobody, and, and somebody doesn't have a personality disorder, let's say, then you would attribute a lot of it to the particular situation and not to the person. So there's always this interaction between the environment and personality. And it's really important to try to, you know, to tease those out because they both influence our behavior to a very large degree. And I think this particular case really forces, you know, forces us to look at this issue. This is, this is obviously an unusual situation the, the, the fact that there's this massive boat crash and someone flies off the boat and, and they die from that particular behavior is it's not an everyday scenario, right? So, so clearly the situation here is unique. It's probably very stressful. It's very traumatic, right? It's the type of situation that would kind of engender a fight or flight type response. So I guess, I guess you could argue that maybe Rand Hooper is completely overwhelmed by the scenario, by this accident, and he doesn't know what to do and he flees. So if this is a version of fight or flight, this is a guy presumably who flees. He just flees. He's, he's, he recognizes the severity of the consequences and and so yeah. that's one argument. Fight or flight, yeah. Fight or flight, right. The problem I have with that, however, is that this is such an outlier. This is such an unusual situation to have a best friend flee a scene when when he knows his friend could be alive is to, it's still extremely unusual. So I, I think when I think about this situation, um, I think we have to dig a little deeper. I, I, I don't, I think it is an unusual situation, but I think there's more going on here. And thinking a little more philosophically, one of the other things I thought about with this particular case is what's called force majeure. I want to hear about that because John told me, I got, I got to say this, John, who doesn't understand that YouTube marketing likes, you know, quick, short titles, like shocking crime, hear more, you know, or, <laughs> or, uh, can you believe this happened? Clickbait, right? Like, just yeah. less is more when it comes to YouTube. Like, oh no, look what happened. Click here, right? That that that's YouTube marketing for you. John was like, "This is what I want the title of tonight to be." What what is that called again? What did you say? Yeah, force majeure. So if you force if you majeure. put He's if you put force majeure in a title on YouTube, you're you're gonna lose like almost your whole audience right away. But you know, right? This is what he said. He goes, Lauren, this is what the title for the YouTube video. I got it. Friendship and force majeure. Dr. John analyzes the curious case of Rand Hooper. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. And Lauren Maybe said, for a podcast, for our podcast, we'll do that for the podcast. Yeah. What did I say? <laughs> Lauren said, if, if we use that title, we're going to have one viewer tonight. And I said, well, it, you know, that's fine. It's something we want, you know, we're, again, this is going to be a nerdy night. So let's, let's just use Best. it. We'll just, let's run with it. I don't know if you did use it, by the way. Did you end up using it? Uh, not really. I'm going to use it for our podcast. I, okay. I used a few things, but yeah, the best, the best headline for YouTube is, oh my gosh, look here. Shocking. You know, that's, <laughs> that's <laughs> right. The best headline is click here. This is life or death or something. Yeah. I don't know. Or you will believe what happens next. Watch till the end. Yeah. Sorry. We don't, we don't have that for you. Force majeure. Okay. Go ahead. So what is force majeure that you wanted for our YouTube headline? So force majeure. Let's talk about this idea of force majeure. Force majeure, broadly speaking, means an act of God. But in my, or, or a, a, a overpowering event. So the, but when I thought about it in terms of this case, I thought of the movie. So there's a Swedish movie from 2014 called force majeure. And it's about a couple who takes their two kids skiing to a ski resort in France. 
Uh, it, it was, it's a beautifully done movie. The acting is amazing. The cinematography is exceptional. I would recommend people watch it. I mean, there are some subtitles, but it's, it's an exceptionally well done movie and it raises a lot of important questions, which is why we're talking about it now. So here's a spoiler alert for those of you who haven't seen the movie. Uh, I'm going to summarize the most important moment in the movie. So if you haven't seen the movie and want to watch it, you might want to turn off now, but in the movie, the family is dining at a restaurant at the bottom of the ski slopes. And all of a sudden they notice an avalanche is coming their way. And the husband, his name is Tomas, he notices, he says, well, it's a controlled avalanche. Let's, don't worry about it. I think we're okay. Meaning that a lot of times in ski resorts, they'll create avalanches so that the risk of skiing is, so the risk of avalanches when people ski is much less. But Tomas says, it's controlled, don't sweat it. And the next thing you know, the the scene goes white. But before that, so as the avalanche is heading downhill towards this restaurant, you can also see that Tomas, he, he gets up from the table, he grabs his cell phone, because you got to have your cell phone no matter what. He grabs his cell phone and he, he, he runs out of the restaurant. And when the, when the, dust settles or the snow settles, you see that his wife, who's named Ebba, his wife and the two kids are sitting there with Ebba and Tomas is nowhere to be found. And then a few minutes later, when you can finally see the whole scene, Tomas returns. So the, the, the whole movie is about trying, so you have this forceur, which is this so-called act of God, even though it's created by the ski resort. Um, and you have Tomas essentially fleeing from his family, not trying to help him in any way. And Ebba has a problem with that. Ebba is extremely upset that her husband just decides that his self-preservation is greater than the family's self-preservation. And it really causes her to reevaluate the entire marriage and their family dynamics. And so that a lot of the movie is about the tension that, that goes on there. And I think that the, there's a similar question here. There's a similar, this raises a big, a big moral question about what exactly are our obligations to other people? What morally are we obligated to help other people, even if it's our family or our best friend? Right. Do we need to, do we need to do that? Right. To, like, so, so does Ebba have a point? Is she correct in, in, in going after Tomas and saying, look, you know, you really, she basically says, you really showed me your true colors because you're a coward and you didn't have any interest in helping the family. And I, I think there's a similar dynamic with Rand Hooper, right? That that does he have an obligation to help his best friend? And of course, if if we're asking that question, you know, this this gets us in the realm of morality. And and I think of, for example, the golden rule from the Gospel of Matthew about doing unto others as they do unto you. But I also think about uh, a German philosopher named Immanuel Kant, who Immanuel Kant had this thing called the categorical imperative. And the categorical, the categorical imperative essentially is a version of the golden rule, but it says that um, you, would act, you act as you would want others to act towards you, and you treat that as a universal law. And Kant says that this is the basis of all morality, that if we use reason to evaluate situations, that we really need to act in a way that we would want others to act towards us. So it's essentially the golden rule. And that idea, by the way, that idea has been the basis for almost all ethical and moral debates in philosophy for centuries. So, so in both, in both this movie force majeure and in the case of Rand Hooper, 
you know, one's fiction, obviously, but it's it's still raising these issues. What's going on? I think so. So the 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 point I'm making about morality is that it's intrinsically social. That the way we treat and act towards others is what defines something as being a moral act. And I I think that the, when we when you look at Rand Hooper, for example. I think one of the things that's so upsetting about it is there's a fundamental violation of that expectation. There's a fundamental violation of the social contract, which is, it's again, going back to these duty to rescue laws. The social contract says that if you're in this type of situation, you have a legal and maybe moral, I mean, that's why I'm raising this. You have a a legal and maybe moral obligation to assist the person in need. And if you don't do that, the law, you know, the, the law will hold you accountable. And, and that's where this case starts moving over into criminality. Right, right. Right. That's where this case starts becoming something criminal. And that's why we're start, when I start, when you start thinking about this case, you have to think about like the criminal psyche in the sense that in many ways, Rand Hooper is operating outside of normal social norms and normal social expectations and normal social roles. Right. And, and that's what, and so that's what makes this problematic. If you look at, and I don't know a lot about Rand Hooper's history, but if if, I do know a little bit, I do know that there's a history of DUI and that I know one time when he was drunk, he shot a friend while he was intoxicated. And so I, I think it's fair to infer that you know, it's it's one thing to have one DUI. Right. You know, you, you get a DUI, you know, you went out with friends, you went party and you get drunk, you get in your car, right? But you 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 get punished, you learn from it. You don't drink again when you drive. But right. not Rand Hooper. Rand Hooper has no problems drinking and driving repeatedly, even though he's being caught and charged with it. And presumably, I don't know, I, I can't find, we don't have the police report on shooting his friend, but he one t- he even shoots a friend one time by accident. I'd like to see Wait, more what? of that. By accident? Well, I yeah, I don't know. I, again, I don't know the details of that. But my point is that there, there's, there's something here that, based on that bit, there's something here, I think, that does have something to do with personality in the sense that I think we're, we're moving over more into the territory of something like narcissism. And I, a few, I people, I'm not, a few people have mentioned that in chat. Yeah. We've been right. speculating over here. Yeah. He, we're, you're, you're moving over into, so I'm not, I can't, I'm not going to diagnose him. Obviously I don't, I've never met him. I don't know his history. I'm just, I'm talking in general about, how a circumstance like this may look narcissistic or how someone like this may have narcissistic features. They break the law repeatedly. They're not concerned about the consequences. They leave their best friend for dead. Right. There, there's something here um, that has to do with entitlement. That's why I'm, I talked about that stuff earlier. You know, his, his father apparently is pretty wealthy. His father presumably is, is, a part of him fighting the charges and encouraging him to fight the charges, even though he, he killed his best friend essentially. Right. So, Jeez. so at the very least you see a lack of empathy. You see. And can I, can, and can I add to the lack of empathy really quickly? Yeah. Graham's brother. I, I did read, I did read one article. <coughs> right before, I read one article right before we started his brother had just passed away. He had lost a brother uh, for, to brain cancer and the family was mourning that death. Yeah. So just when you bring a lack of empathy of a best friend, so not only is his best friend, but his best friend has lost family and been heartbroken over the loss of his brother. It's just, sorry, just go on. You know, I just, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. So I, I think this, and so this is where, this is where this case starts moving a little bit away from the, the unique situation into more, <coughs> excuse me, starts moving away from the traumatic situation into something that resembles more to do with personality. And we can infer that 
because he's completely indifferent to the fact that his best friend's in the water and he's indifferent to his friend's suffering, his friend's pain, and even his friend's life. And he's also making the assessment clearly that his life is much more valuable than Graham McCormick's. And that if he can somehow evade responsibility for this, then he perceives, I think, that he can just go on with his life unfazed. Right? And all of that would, would start kind of encroaching upon this narcissistic turf. So I, I think that I think this is where this particular crime looks like it's not just the situation, but it's also you have the strong personality variable that may or may not be narcissistic personality disorder. I don't know, but it, it clearly involves some narcissistic features that are coming into play. This lack of empathy. And let me just, I'll just, just to remind people about the diagnosis of narcissism from the DSM-5. Just some of the, I'll just quickly, some of the elements of narcissism in a diagnosis are grandiosity and self-importance, a sense of superiority and specialness, a sense of entitlement, manipulation and exploitation of others, a lack of empathy, arrogant and contemptuous attitudes and behaviors. So those are all ones that I picked up on that may be related to the, this particular crime. There is manipulation going on here too, because he lies to the police. He tries to mislead them. He gives them false statements. He misleads them. So I'm going to. And, and as people have pointed out, he even ended up speaking at his funeral because the family didn't yet know how involved he was in the death. Just so many, just so many things that showed a lack of empathy and disconnect. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the way he handled the situation, I can't even, I wouldn't have even guessed. I didn't know that, but that's, that's crazy that he spoke at the funeral. That was actually the other thing in the article I read and other people have been mentioning it. We have a few locals here. They're saying the same thing. So the, this, this, by the way, brings us into, so I wouldn't, I don't think it would be a surprise to most of our viewers to learn that, that there might be some personality issues involved here and that there's a relationship between narcissism and criminality. I don't think that's, that's probably not new news to anyone, but I'm going to read, this is from, this is from an, uh, a chapter, this is chapter 13 in a book called Clinical Forensic Psychology. It's a fairly new textbook. It's an excellent textbook, but that's what there's, you are. Okay. There's, a, <laughs> there's a chapter 13, narcissistic, narcissistic personality disorder and deviant behavior. So it's about narcissism and criminality. This is page 245. I'm going to quote this because it's relevant to what we're talking about. Quote. A situation can also become too emotionally overwhelming and intolerable, which makes narcissists unable to respond appropriately. Perceiving others' emotions can evoke overwhelming powerlessness, disgust, shame, or loss of internal control that can trigger strong aggressive reactions or emotional and physical withdrawal. So I really like that quote because it starts getting close to explaining what's going on here. That the, I think this is both a combination of personality and situation. Maybe 50-50. I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't put an exact number on it. But, but their point is that emotions are difficult for narcissists to begin with. If you put them into a really stressful situation – an overwhelming situation where there, there's emotional overload and they have to make sense of a situation that, for, you know, when, when Graham McCormick goes in the water, you're asking someone to have an emotional, an appropriate emotional response to that scenario. And that person may or may not be able to have that appropriate response. In this particular case, obviously they don't. The response is to flee. So part of this has to do with potentially with the way a narcissist might respond to this type of stressful situation. 
that someone who can process emotions better and someone who would be less overwhelmed by emotions, they might handle this in a much more effective manner. So in that sense, I think you're starting to see if, if I'm thinking about you know this in terms of the fundamental attribution error, you see how these two components of personality and situation really blend here. And I think that's probably the best, maybe the best way to explain what's going on. Okay. Huh. A lot of questions here in chat about nature versus nurture and okay. all that. But you keep yeah. you keep going. You keep okay. going. And right. Um, we we'll keep you focused because this is so interesting. We're loving this. Thank you, babe. Let's, but so, so I think that's, that would be my attempt to begin to explain the why of, you know, why he flees. But I think we're, we still have to think about this friendship component because that's the component that I just can't, you know, that just, I can't get past, right? It's, it's the thing that has really kept me glued to this case and thinking about this case for a while. And and again, I want I want to bring in this movie Force Majeure. I don't know if anyone's seen it. Has, has anybody talked about it in the chat? It wasn't a super popular movie, but um, yes, we had one listener from Sweden who okay. said it was a great movie. Yeah, it is. It, yes. Mm -hmm. So the 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 thing about this scenario with Rand Hooper and the movie Force Majeure is. This idea of friendship and how far we can go, right? I, I think that the, the question this movie raises, it's an existential question. And the existential question is that friendship really makes demands upon us. That the, the question in that movie is for Tomas, who's the husband, is who is he? It's fundamentally asking about who he is and why he's not able to assist his family in this moment of need or crisis. And I, I, I think that's a question, by the way, in the movie that his wife constantly is, is bringing up, you know, she taunts him with it. You know, why didn't you act? You're a coward. I mean, and there's issues of masculinity there too, by the way. So, you know, our man expected to, to always protect their families, right. I, you know, so, but it, that's that's part of that movie. Um, so I, I think in many ways, true friendship can be a test, uh, especially when there's trauma and there's moments of, of crisis. And it, it really, those types of situations really ask us to, to evaluate who we are and what we're willing to do to help other people. And and so I think if you see it that way, you know, to me, uh, the the Rand Hooper situation is 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 a test that he obviously fails. You know, he he fails hugely. And the, the question I keep asking myself is, why does he fail that test so egregiously? Why is he so right? And as best I can determine, so in thinking about this for the past few months, you know, I would say, and again, this kind of brings us into the criminal mind. Uh, I think if I had to kind of figure out why he fails the friendship test, I would say that the components of this crime that seem to stand out to me are denial, shame, narcissism, fear, self-preservation, powerlessness, vulnerability and entitlement. And so I think okay. if, if you put those elements together, which by the way, those, those elements are present in, in people that commit much more serious crimes. So, so to see those qualities in Rand Hooper is in some ways to say that the jury, the jury got it right. That's not to say that this is going to be a career criminal or that he's necessarily a criminal in a larger sense. He's probably not. The situation was certainly unique. However, 
those components I just mentioned, those qualities often show up in very serious criminal behaviors. They show up and sometimes in serial killers, right? And so, so I, I, I think there's, and again, I'm not calling Rand Hooper any of those things, but it's interesting for me to reflect on how in some ways friendship becomes a reflection of who we are. That if you fail at that fundamental act of friendship of your best friend, if you're not willing to save his life, then there's probably deeper problems going on. There's probably yeah. something there. There's probably something there that you really need to look at, right? There's probably something there that you really need to solve about yourself because things are not working well when you do that. Clearly. So I was, um, I was going to, I was just going to end with a quote and kind of discuss that a little bit, but we could, before I do that, you know, we could take some questions or. Yeah. Thank you for asking. There have been great questions that have been, um, going through the chat. I, I don't have my notes tonight. Again, I, I don't have my office. I'm at our, I'm at our kitchen table, our dinner table where we often talk, uh, where we record our Patreon episodes. This is where John and I do that, where we record our Patreon snacks. But um, a lot of people are, I think, really intrigued by nature versus nurture and what what creates something like this. Um, I like what somebody said something about she was concerned her daughter didn't have empathy, so she nurtured that right okay. into her at a young age. Okay. I like that because sometimes I think the, the idea, someone said, how do you teach empathy to a child? And someone said, by showing them empathy, by being empathic. And so I like the idea that she nurtured something right out of her. Um, but, you know, some there's been a lot of, I guess there's been a lot of comments in chat today too about perhaps tough love or there's this idea that he's privileged, right? Mm -hmm. which, yeah, which we, equate, which we equate to being spoiled maybe or yeah. uh, never disciplined or getting everything he wants. But, but then some people say, well, then he just needed some tough love. You know what I mean? Then it gets to like, well, you like, know, like Paul him. Murdoch. Yeah. Like Paul Murdoch. And so why wasn't anyone, you know, teaching him tough love? But at the same time, I think you've taught me and we discuss how children are actually taught empathy through empathy, not necessarily tough love. I, I don't know where I'm going. I'm just sharing some things because people, I think what we talk about here is what creates somebody, what creates all of those things you just listed and that's a lot of the discussion happening in chat as well. Like what could have happened to Rand? And clearly there's uh, nature and DNA and personality involved. But what could have been different in his life too? Yeah. So I know you don't know him super well, but. Right. Well, in general, that's, it's, it, it's a good question. So. In general, so this is from, I'm going to read from an article. This is going to be a really broad synthesis of a lot of research, but um, Jessica, Jessica Yakely, you probably can't see this, but she wrote an article fairly recently, 2018, called Current Understanding of Narcissism and Narcissistic Personality Disorder. She's done some excellent work in this area, by the way, but she says essentially that some of the some of the main components, if you want to create a narcissist, some of the main components are, quote, parental coldness and emotional control of the child. Parental coldness, parental and coldness. emotional control of the child. So, in other sounds words, like love, sounds like tough love to me. <laughs> Well, but the, but the, she's saying that's what creates a narcissist. Yeah, but that's what I mean. Right. That's what I'm saying. What creates right. so, a narcissist sounds like, I guess I should define what tough love is. That could mean something different for anyone. So I guess I'm not a cold, like, a, so so maybe that's, someone's definition of tough love could be completely different than my definition. When I think of tough love, I think of things like Ruby Frankie taking away her son's bed, you know, or saying that they have to sweep and scrub the floors 
or not have dinner. Um, yeah. You know, and, and so, and so like the, the research shows that that would be, that would be kind of productive. Right. The research is sh showing that is not what you do. That, I guess I just want to make note of that. That's not what you do. Right. That, do that doesn't make a less privileged child in the end. Yeah, it, it makes an angry child. It makes a, a, a child that can't cope with their emotions, that can't deal with shame. That, you know, generally speaking, I think that you want a child that can process their emotions openly. And I think in a lot of families that where narcissists are created, there's an inability to to understand emotions, to identify emotions, to express emotions, especially emotions that are difficult, like shame, sadness, fear. So if you do that, you'll simply, a child will simply lack any ability to, to really, or not any, in, in, a, the, 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 in general, they might struggle to develop healthy relationships. And to clarify what I meant by Ruby Frankie, because um, uh, what what Rudy Ruby and Jody were arrested with is not tough love. It was it's abuse. It's sick. What I meant is what Ruby Frankie and Kevin Frankie showed us on their family's YouTube channel before they were arrested. Just want to clarify that I was not equating to what they were arrested for. It was little hints of what people were seeing as far as their pr pr parenting tactics on YouTube. So I do want to clarify. Th and thanks for, for making that clarification, John. So it sounds like also like a lack of understanding a child's emotions. And, uh, and there's, I mean, there, of course there's other ways. There's a lot of research showing that trauma and any, you know, trauma and child abuse and neglect will contribute to narcissism as well. So so children, obviously, that are subjected to really adverse circumstances are much more likely to repress emotions and to feel wounded and hurt and to experience a lot of pain and suffering. And oftentimes they're incapable because these, their families won't address those types of emotions. They're incapable of expressing those emotions. And so big narcissism is a compromised solution. It's a way for them to cover up those feelings of hurt and that pain and to feel special. So it becomes a response to an emotional wound. If that makes sense in the sense that this whole idea of grandiosity and feeling special and entitled is really a reaction to not feeling that way, to feeling like you're not special, that you're just ordinary and that you're, you're it's, it's a way to avoid all that pain from childhood. So that's, that's another way to do it. And of course, if you, if you have emotional wounds from childhood and you have controlling parents and an inability of parents to recognize emotions, then, then it's a really, it's going to be a really difficult scenario for children to thrive in. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll never again, forget the person who said, you want to teach your child empathy, show them empathy. So let me, I'm just gonna, I want to finish with a quote here for anybody who's interested in this topic of friendship from a philosophical standpoint, I recommend this book on friendship by Alexander Nihamas. He's an excellent author. He's written some really outstanding works of philosophy. This book was published in 2016. This is from page 225. Quote, Friendship does no more than bind a few people together. The people who can say to each other, I love you because it's... I'm sorry, let me start again. Quote, friendship does no more than... Oh, I'm, I'm going to back up. Let's redo this. There's a, a sentence before that I think is important that I want to throw out there. Page 225, quote, Some ancients thought that friendship binds the whole universe together. We are more modest. Friendship does no more than bind a few people together. 
the people who can say to each other, I love you because it is you, because it is I. But friendship finally makes us ask, who here is the you and who the I? I want let me repeat that last line. Friendship finally makes us ask who here is the you and who the I. So my question is what happens when we re- what happens to us to our communities our society when we start to eliminate the you's and we're only left with the eyes. Cuz clearly somebody like Rand Hooper doesn't have much sense of the use. And I think the other, the other beautiful part of that quote, the idea that, that friendship binds the universe together, although he, the author disagrees with that, I think it's, it's beautifully said in the sense that without friendship, we lose that. Without, I think without friendship, we lose that social connection and in some way. So if friendship is, according to the, the ancients and the Greeks, if friendship's what binds the universe together, then destroying friendships is what unravels the universe. And I think that's, to me, that's, that's what's so disturbing about this case with Rand Hooper is that Again, if, if friendship is the glue that holds the universe together, then when, you, when we start seeing these types of behaviors repeatedly, when we start engaging in really hateful and harmful behaviors, especially towards our friends, then in some ways I think that's where the, the universe begins to unwind and unravel, and I think that's where we're all in trouble. And I think that's why I've lost sleep over this case, because in some ways I think that Rand Hooper, for me at least, has poked a big hole in my universe and really forced me to question this idea of friendship and morality and where we're at in our society at the moment. And um, so I, I think there's a lot of big questions here. And I just hope that, that for most of us, we can continue to find, we know the I part, and we need to figure out who we are and what that means. But I think we always need to keep in mind that there's there's always a you out there too. And that you oftentimes is equally important. And that's what makes friendship. Thank you. People are asking me to write the quote in the chat, but I don't think what people realize is I'm in one room, you're in another. They have the che- They have the quote just as much as I have the quote. I don't have the quote in front of me, everyone. And so if, if, if someone else can write it in uh, chat, that would be great. Okay. Um, yeah, well, that's we beautiful. can you know, I. Yeah, I think of, and I don't know why my mind went here, because I think many of us only imagine, we can only imagine their last moments, but um, Kaylee and Maddie, best friends who... Uh, we're, we're best friends since they were little girls and because of a crime, their lives were taken together. Um, I think we've learned a lot about their friendship as victims because they were victims of Brian Koberger or allegedly Brian Koberger, I'll say. Um, I think we've learned so much about their friendship and how they were inseparable and how they stood up for each other. And so while you might have lost sleep over over this case and what Rand has been convicted of doing to his best friend, Graham. I think we can also remember friendships that exist like Maddie and Kaylee, although theirs were cut short too, and that there are beautiful friendships out there and, and we can, you know, so not all is lost as I guess I'm telling my, my sweet dear husband who these things do keep him up at night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um I worry about it. I worry about the state of friendship and friendships in our world today. So I think in that sense this this case with Rand Hooper has a lot of relevance to our society at the moment and our capacity to 
see the U's and to, to see people that potentially could be friends, but we're, we're simply not open to that possibility. Edamame Ebedemame said, thank you, Dr. John. I will thank my good friends tomorrow. Gratitude. Someone else, uh, Lola wrote, I just reconnected with my best friend after years of no contact. We picked the friendship right up and didn't miss, miss a beat. Um, I too will do what Edamame at a moment stated and I will reach out to friends because I have a two need to thank them. Thank you. Thank you, babe. Yeah. And, 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 you know, thinking about Rand Hooper has really forced me to, to look at that a little more closely. I mean, I, I think I've, I've always felt like I was pretty secure with some of my best friends, but oftentimes maybe I, I don't let them know enough what they mean to me. And so this case, I think really, has forced some reevaluation on my part as well. Yes. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. Thank you, John. Um, thank you. I think we need to do this every few weeks, if not every week. I love this. This was, thank you. You for mean, you mean not, not, talk, not talk about cases in Idaho? <laughs> oh. No, being able to fully just listen to you and take it in oh. too, you uh -huh. know? So often you and I are planning these cases together. I'm pulling all of the sound bites we're going to use and we've been talking and there's always quite a bit of anxiety and stress right before a show. And this, I have genuinely enjoyed listening to you thank tonight. You. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But as predicted, our, our viewership is much less because you, as you warned me, we can't use worms, terms like force majeure and expect well, and expect I'll to go, have a big audience. I'll go change the headline to shocking. <laughs> Oberger, Ruby, Frankie. Uh, what else? <laughs> Daybell. Right. You won't believe it. Come look. Yeah, I'll switch the headline. Then we'll get the views. No, just kidding. Uh, you, you'll bring the views. It's okay, babe. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, we'll not tonight. What, keep doing not tonight. what you do best. Keep doing what you do best and the views will come. We love you. Not, not tonight, but I'm passionate about this topic. So I'm passionate to have a, a minute to step back and think about the, the larger implications of some of the crimes we talk about. So so it's like, so now bring in the Mormon church. So how does the Mormon church play into this case? Just <laughs> a bad joke. Bad joke. Too soon? Too soon? Sorry. Bad right. The plot twist. You're going to have to edit this out, by the way. Plot twist. Rand Hooper was Mormon. <laughs> kidding no jennifer. yeah just scratch thanks. that scratch thanks. that scratch thanks for that. the humor jennifer yeah okay thanks everyone thanks for being here tonight um again if if you did appreciate this um please give us a like thank you for subscribing to our channel um and come join us over on on patreon patreon.com slash hidden true crime again john and i did a couple episodes this week where we just sort of uh we put on it's very casual we put on the phone voice memo recorder it's it's far from professional and <laughs> and then we share our little uh insider conversations uh raw and unedited so you could just someone mentioned this so they feel like suri or alexa listening in on us so all right everyone thanks so much for being here tonight and thank your friends tomorrow and be grateful for those friendships. So often we get caught up to in our uh, virtual friendships, um, which are also very, very important. I have some, but um, those true friends that have been with us through it all. Thank you, babe. Yeah. Thanks guys for hanging in there um, tonight. I know it was to quote the person who emailed me, it was a little nerdier than normal, but I appreciate the, the comments and responses and thank you. Thanks. All right, everyone. Have a great night and we'll see you next week. Okay. Good night. Good night.